We need to talk. Those four words dropped like a bomb, shattering the peaceful evening I'd envisioned after getting the twins tucked into bed. Beckett's face was grim, almost. Guilty? My heart started pounding. What's going on? I asked carefully. He wouldn't meet my eyes. Alara, I... I want a divorce. The room started spinning. Divorce? After eight years of marriage? We had our struggles like any couple, but divorce never crossed my mind. Why? I sputtered out. Beckett finally looked up, his expression pained but resolved. I've met someone else, and she's pregnant. The floor seemed to fall away beneath me. Pregnant? With his child? How could this be happening? We were supposed to be forever. Who, who is she? I demanded, my voice shaking with rage and devastation. Her name is Fiona. She's twenty-nine. He swallowed hard. I never meant to hurt you like this, Alara. I barked out a hollow laugh. You never meant to hurt me? You're having a baby with another woman behind my back. I'm so sorry, he said weakly. I tried to fight it, but I've fallen in love with her. My chest felt hollow. I struggled to breathe around the pain constricting my lungs. Beckett loved someone else. My husband betrayed me in the worst way. I opened my mouth, but no words came out. Tears blurred my vision as the reality crashed over me in waves. Anger, hurt, shock, it was all too much. Get out. I finally managed in a hoarse whisper. Beckett looked stricken. Alara, please, we should talk about this. Get the hell out of my house! I screamed, startling even myself with the raw fury in my voice. How dare you do this to me, to us! His shoulders slumped in defeat. Slowly Beckett turned and walked out the door, leaving me alone to crumple to the floor in racking sobs. My life as I knew it was over. The man I loved gave everything to, started a family with, he threw it all away for another woman. I was adrift, lost in a sea of betrayal with no anchor. How could he do this to me, to our daughters? My chest ached with each ragged breath. Sudden fear gripped me. What would I tell Dahlia and Iris? I couldn't let their world shatter like mine just had. Focus, Alara. You have to protect them now. Survive and fight, for their sake. I dragged myself up off the floor, wiping away tears with shaky hands. Through the blur I caught a glimpse of the twins' bedroom door cracked open just a bit. Had they heard the awful fight and ugly truth about their father? My heart broke anew at the thought. I abandoned thoughts of waking them. They deserved one more night of innocence before the world as they knew it ended. Tomorrow there would be questions, tears, and unimaginable hurt. But not tonight. Tonight I finally understood the true meaning of betrayal. The next morning, I felt numb, like my soul had been ripped out of my body, leaving an empty shell behind. How could Beckett do this to me? To our family? The questions swirled endlessly in my hungover mind. I had slept fitfully on the couch, crying until I physically couldn't anymore. The twins would be up soon, and I had no idea what to tell them. How do you explain adultery and abandonment to six-year-olds? As if on cue, the pitter-patter of little feet reached my ears. Dahlia and Iris appeared in the hallway, all smiles and innocence. That innocence I aimed to protect for as long as possible. Morning, Mommy! Dahlia piped up cheerfully. I managed a weak smile. Hey, sweeties. How about we have a lazy morning and watch cartoons? Distracting them briefly bought me time to figure out the next move. The girls happily settled in front of the TV as I retreated to the kitchen to make coffee. Lots of coffee. A knock at the door jolted me from my stupor. Please don't let it be Beckett. I can't face him again so soon. I opened it cautiously and immediately regretted doing so. There stood Mira, lips pursed in a tight line, eyes boring into me with harsh judgment. Hello, Alara, she said icily. I take it you've heard the news about my son? I bristled at her tone. You mean him cheating on me with some woman and getting her pregnant? Mira's eyes narrowed. There's no need for such crass language. Beckett is simply exploring new paths in his life. I stared at her in disbelief. Are you actually defending him right now? After what he did to me? To our daughters? I'm not here to take sides, she sniffed. I've come to make sure the girls are being properly cared for until the situation resolves itself. The nerve of this woman— as if Beckett was just going through a phase and I was the unstable one holding my family hostage. You listen to me, I hissed, barely containing my rage. Those are my daughters, too, and I'll be damned if I let anyone make them pick sides or disrupt their lives further. Mira straightened up imperiously. Well, we'll just see about that. 
I expect Beckett will have primary custody once the divorce is settled. A harsh laugh escaped my lips. You delusional bitch. After the way he has betrayed us, keep dreaming. Her hand flew to her chest in feigned indignation. How dare you speak to me that way? This is exactly why you aren't fit to raise my grandchildren. Get out, I shouted, causing Dahlia and Iris to turn towards the commotion with wide eyes. Get out of my home and don't come back until you've removed that stick from your ass. Mira's face mottled in anger. But I didn't give her a chance to respond, slamming the door in her face. I was shaking with fury as I turned to face my daughters. Seeing their worried expressions immediately deflated me. What was I doing, losing control like that? They didn't deserve the trauma I was unloading on them. Swallowing hard, I mustered a reassuring, assuring smile. Why don't we get dressed and go to the park? It's such a beautiful day. They nodded uncertainly. I hugged them both tightly, a tear slipping down my cheek. They were all I had left now. And I would fight like hell to protect them from the vicious vultures descending, no matter what it took. After the disastrous encounter with Mira, I knew I needed allies in the battle ahead. I couldn't take on Beckett and his entitled family alone while trying to shield the twins. There was only one person I could truly count on. My brother, Jude. We'd always been close, and he fiercely protective of me ever since our parents' divorce when I was twelve. I quickly dialed his number, fighting back more tears as it rang. Hello? Jude's concerned voice came through the line. Jude? I choked out. It's Beckett. He, he wants a divorce. There was a stunned silence before Jude responded, his voice low and dangerous. What did that son of a bitch do? I told him everything, the other woman, the pregnancy, the appalling way Mira had reacted. With each revelation, I could practically hear Jude's blood pressure rising. That miserable bastard, he growled when I finished. Don't you worry, sis, we'll make him pay for this. His fierce protectiveness was exactly what I needed. Can you come over? I could really use your help and support right now. I'm on my way. We're going to fight this, Alara. He won't get away with destroying our family. Forty minutes later, Jude stormed through the front door looking every bit the avenging brother. His eyes were blazing with anger. Girls, why don't you go play in your room for a bit? I said gently to the confused twins. Uncle Jude and I need to talk about some grown-up things. Once they were out of earshot, Jude rounded on me. Start from the beginning. Don't leave out a single damn detail. I recounted the nightmarish conversation with Beckett from the previous evening. Jude listened stone-faced until I got to the part about the other woman's name. Wait. Fiona? As in that Fiona, the perky blonde from his office? I nodded miserably. You know her? Damn it! He furious slammed a fist on the counter. I see her hanging all over him at the office Christmas parties shamelessly flirting, the way she looks at him, God, I want to puke. My heart constricted at the thought of how long this might have been going on under my nose. That's why Beckett had been coming home late, distant, making lame excuses about working. We can't let him take advantage of you like this, Alara, Jude seethed. I'll get you the best bulldog divorce lawyer in the city to go after him for full custody and every penny he's worth. A fervent determination replaced my broken despair. Maybe with Jude's help, I could maintain control over this tsunami of chaos crashing into my life. You're right, I stated with steel in my voice. It's time to play hardball. That liar is about to learn you don't disrespect a wife and mother. A grim look of approval etched Jude's features. Damn right. Let's gather the troops and bury that snake where he belongs, in the ground. In that moment, I felt a surge of strength. With my protective brother as a fierce ally, bring fortified for the coming war over my family. After Jude's emboldening visit, I felt a renewed sense of determination coursing through me. I would not be the sad, crumpled shadow of a woman Beckett had so callously discarded. Not anymore. My first priority was ensuring Dahlia and Iris didn't get crushed under the weight of the tsunami crashing into our lives. I had to be the steady anchor keeping them secure while the storm raged. Who wants to go get ice cream? I asked in an overly bright voice peeking into their room. Twin faces lit up at the sugary prospect. Me, me, me! They chorused excitedly. I smiled, trying to keep the painful realities at bay for the moment. As we walked to the ice cream shop, I centered myself on their innocent babbling and tiny hands clutching mine tightly. 
if only I could freeze this moment forever, shielding them from the ugliness that threatened to encroach on their pure, joyful worlds. But I couldn't, not realistically. All I could do was face it head-on and emerge victorious for their sake. Two chocolates! Iris shouted her order to the pimply teenager behind the counter, jarring me from my swirling thoughts. Make that three chocolates, I added, determination lacing my tone. If they detected any tension, the girls gave no indication, contentedly devouring their frozen treats as we slowly made our way back home. I envied their blissful ignorance for just a little while longer. When we arrived back at the house, a pit formed in my stomach. Beckett's car was there, waiting like a ticking time bomb about to detonate the fragile piece I'd tried to construct. Sure enough, the front door flew open, and there he stood, eyes bloodshot and narrowed into a heated glare. "'Where the hell have you been?' he demanded through gritted teeth. "'I've been calling you for hours!' The venomous words immediately put me on guard, hackles raised protectively in front of the twins. "'We went out for ice cream. Not that I need to explain myself to you,' I shot back icily. Beckett seemed to realize his mistake, face falling as he glanced at Dahlia and Iris clinging to my sides uncertainly. "'Girls, could you go play for a bit? Daddy needs to talk to Mommy.' His tone was saccharine, a clear attempt to diffuse the tension. I leveled him with a fierce look. Whatever you have to say can be said in front of them. He huffed out an exasperated breath. Fine. Have it your way. I want to discuss reasonable visitation now that things have changed. My jaw clenched in righteous anger. You mean now that you've thrown our family into chaos by cheating and getting your fling pregnant? Beckett recoiled slightly at my frank words. Good, I didn't mince them intentionally, wanting to dismantle the nice guy act he was putting on. Well, that's not fair, Alara, he said tightly, all traces of the calm facade crumbling. We've had problems for years that you conveniently ignore. Don't you dare try to blame me for your despicable choices, I roared, no longer caring if the twins heard. They deserved to know the depths of their father's betrayal. Fire flashed in Beckett's eyes, but I pressed on emboldened by my protectiveness over my little girls. You'll get court-ordered visitation when I allow it. No more, no less, and you can sure as hell bet I'm taking you for every penny you're worth. For once, Beckett seemed to have no snide retort. I held his gaze steadily, almost daring him to crumble further. He was the one who did this to us. Don't start something you can't finish, he finally growled in a low, menacing tone that should have terrified me. But— I only felt pure, vindicated fury singing through my veins. I don't make threats, I stated flatly. I make promises. And I will burn you to the ground before letting you take my babies from me. Beckett held my fiery glare for a beat, then finally turned and stormed out, slamming the door behind him hard enough to rattle the windows. Only then did I let out the shuddering breath I hadn't realized I'd been holding. There would be no more crying no more wilting in the face of his wrath. Not when I had the two most precious treasures in the world to protect at all costs. I was a mother, a warrior, and God help anyone who underestimated the molten force of my resolve. In the days following my explosive confrontation with Beckett, a cold silence descended over the house. He would come and go without a word, barely even looking at me or the girls. Good. His cowardly absence suited me just fine, as I finalized my legal battle strategy with Jude and the bulldog divorce attorney he'd secured, a fierce woman named Miranda, who seemed to delight in destroying adulterous men like my soon-to-be ex-husband. "'We're going to take him for everything he's worth,' Miranda said with chilling certainty during our first meeting. The evidence of his affair, negligence towards his children, manipulation, it's overwhelming.' I felt a dark sense of satisfaction seeing the color drain from Beckett's face as Miranda methodically listed off his litany of sins. This is a gross misrepresentation. He sputtered once she'd finished. I'm an excellent father who provides for my family. Save it for the judge, Miranda retorted without missing a beat. We have evidence you've been financially supporting your mistress, as well as video of you and Miss Fiona getting cozy at office parties. My lip curled in disgust at the implication. Beckett shrank back in his chair, suddenly looking very small beneath Miranda's withering glare. Alara will have full custody, she stated in a tone that brokered no argument. 
you'll be on the hook for substantial child and spousal support, plus she gets the house and the majority of your joint assets. Beckett's mouth opened and closed uselessly, seemingly unable to formulate a response to such a brutal legal and financial gutting. I felt a vindictive surge of elation watching the shock and realization play out on his features. That, that's not feasible, he finally managed to choke out. Y you can't expect me to agree to those lopsided terms. Miranda fixed him with a predatory smile that sent a shiver down my spine. I don't expect you to agree, Mr. Foster. I expect you to comply once the judge signs off and makes it official. Unable to contain myself any longer, I laughed coldly. What's the matter, dear husband? Are you upset at the prospect of losing everything as you so richly deserve? Beckett's eyes smoldered with impotent rage as they bored into me. You're being completely unreasonable. This isn't a compromise. This isn't a negotiation, I shot back fiercely. You unilaterally blew up our family for some cheap thrill with a woman half your age. I'm taking back what's mine, and then some. He opened his mouth to retort, but seemed to think better of it, and snapped his jaw shut, jaw muscle twitching. I suggest you get very comfortable with your mistress, Miranda interjected smoothly. You'll be supporting two households very soon, though I shudder to think how you'll afford it. Something dark flickered across Beckett's expression at the brutal dig. You haven't heard the last of this, he growled lowly, as if on cue, the conference room door opened and in walked Fiona, clearly distressed. She was cradling her pregnant belly protectively. Beckett's entire demeanor instantly shifted, softening as he regarded the meek young woman with saccharine tenderness. It made me want to vomit. Fiona, darling, what's wrong? he asked with sickeningly feigned concern. She sniffled, eyes downcast. I, I heard you were getting divorced. Why didn't you tell me you were married? The room seemed to drop a few degrees at her naive question. A tense, loaded silence stretched on endlessly. Finally, Miranda stood abruptly. I believe we have everything we need here today. We'll see you both in court. Too stunned and wounded to respond, Fiona merely nodded, still not meeting anyone's gaze. As Beckett hurried out after her, no doubt to begin another series of lies and manipulations, I caught Jude's satisfied gaze from across the room. He subtly raised a fist in silent celebration of the first salvo being fired. I echoed the gesture back grimly. The war had well and truly begun. In the aftermath of that explosive first legal meeting, the dark clouds gathering over Beckett and his web of lies grew stormier by the day. I could practically taste his desperation as he scrambled for ways to save face and regain control of the rapidly deteriorating situation. This is ridiculous, Alara, he shouted one evening, storming into the living room where I sat grading student essays. Those demands from your shark lawyer are outrageous. I didn't even bother looking up from my work. What? You mean requesting full custody of my daughters and my fair share after you betrayed us? Get over it. Our daughters, he bit out through gritted teeth. And you can't be serious about taking the house, too. Where am I supposed to live? With your knocked-up floozy? I replied coolly, finally meeting his blazing glare. I really don't care, Beckett. You lit the match that burned this family to the ground. You self-righteous He exploded, nostrils flaring. You think you can take everything from me and get away with it? I'll fight you every step. I simply shrugged, unperturbed by his toddler tantrum. Save your breath. The courts don't look too kindly on adulterers, especially ones who abandon their kids. You've already lost this battle. Beckett's face modeled an alarming shade of purple, but before he could hurl another insult, a tiny voice rang out from the hallway. Daddy? Why are you yelling at Mommy? Iris was standing there, eyes wide with bewilderment and fear. For a split second, Beckett seemed to deflate, all the blustering arrogance draining from his expression. Then it contorted with an ugly sneer as he turned his rage on our innocent daughter. Stay out of this, he barked harshly. It's none of your business. Iris flinched violently at his vicious tone. Tears immediately welled up in her big eyes as her lower lip started quivering. That was the final straw for me. With a feral snarl, I launched myself off the couch straight at Beckett, shoving him backwards viciously. Don't you ever speak to her like that again, I raged, seeing red. Get out! Get out of this house before I... A pitiful wail sounded from the hallway as Iris collapsed to the floor, 
overwrought by her father's cruelty. Dahlia was there, too, eyes wide with shock and fear as she tried to comfort her twin with trembling arms. The awful sound was like a bucket of ice water, immediately snapping me out of my blinding fury. What was I doing, losing control in front of them like this? They were the innocents I was supposed to be protecting. With visible effort, I managed to unclench my fists and take a step back from Beckett, who was regarding me with a mix of fury and something like cruel satisfaction. "'Look what you've done,' he sneered lowly. "'Is this the great mother you think you are?' I opened my mouth to unleash another torrent of vitriol at him, but stopped myself. As much as I longed to flay him with the scathing retort on the tip of my tongue, the sounds of my daughter's anguished sobs cut straight to my core. With a look of pure disgust, I brushed past Beckett and hurried to where Dahlia and Iris huddled on the floor, pulling them both into my arms as their little bodies shook. "'It's okay, babies,' I murmured over and over in what I hoped was a soothing tone. "'Mommy's here. I've got you.' Beckett watched the emotional scene play out with hooded eyes, arms folded across his chest, in a strange mix of petulance and arrogant posturing. Finally, he simply turned on his heel and stormed out, the front door slamming hard enough to rattle the walls. Only when his angry footsteps had faded did I finally let my own tears fall, mingling with the streams soaking my daughter's da horrified faces. I'm sorry, I gasped out brokenly. I'm so sorry you had to see that. This isn't your fault, I promise. Dahlia lifted her head first, dark eyes still swimming with fright and confusion. Why does Daddy yell so much now? I don't like it. The anguish in her small voice tore at my heart. How could I explain the dynamics of a collapsing marriage to my babies without utterly shattering their worlds? I hugged them both tighter, brushing away their tears with my thumbs and struggling to maintain my own composure. It's a grown-up problem that Daddy and I are working through, I said haltingly. But no matter what, you'll always have me and each other. Okay? We're a team. A team of three against the world, if need be. Alone, scared, but unbreakably bonded in the face of Beckett's deceptions and cruelty. It was the only truth I could offer them. Dahlia gave a jerky nod, but Iris just burrowed deeper against my chest as fresh sobs escaped. I stroked her hair and softly sang an old lullaby, hoping to soothe her frayed nerves. In that moment, despite the swirling chaos and Beckett's monstrous behavior, I felt a powerful sense of purpose. These two precious girls were my entire world— my reason for drawing breath, to protect them, to love them fiercely, no matter how insurmountable the odds seemed, and I would burn down heaven and earth itself before allowing that snake to harm another hair on their innocent heads. In the weeks following Beckett's deplorable outburst in front of the girls, the whispers and sidelong glances began. Our once happy family's implosion was no longer a private affair. It was now community entertainment, ripe for gossip and scrutiny. Picking up on the unease none too subtly, Iris asked one morning at breakfast, "'Why do people stare at us at the grocery store, Mommy?' I forced a tight smile. "'Don't worry about them, sweetie. Eat your cereal.' But inwardly I seethed. Talk was spreading, no doubt fueled by Beckett's own desperate smear campaign to salvage his tarnished reputation. The coward was working overtime to paint me as the unhinged shrew in our disintegrating marriage." I knew this because muttered brickbats from former friends, and his sycophantic colleagues started filtering back to me. Poor Beckett, trapped in such a toxic marriage for years. Alara always did seem a bit high-strung. I heard she's trying to take him for everything—house, money, kids. How vindictive can you get? Each backhanded insult added fuel to the slow burn of hatred I nursed for that unfaithful snake. He was getting what he deserved— karmic retribution delivered by the very people he'd been deceiving right alongside me for who knew how long. His dirty laundry was airing itself, one reeking garment at a time. My entire world became a merciless gauntlet of judgment wherever I ventured out. Sidelong looks brimming with sanctimonious reproach, whispers abruptly cutting off as I passed in grocery store aisles or at the park. I held my head high, shielding my girls as best I could, while flames of humiliation licked at my insides. At least Beckett had the benefit of a sordid romantic narrative to hide behind, his poor, trapped soul finally being true to himself, or whatever justification was being peddled about his caddish behavior. If only they knew the full, sordid truth of his deceptions. 
which is exactly what I got the chance to reveal one fateful evening after opening an email from none other than Beckett's mistress herself. Fiona had attached video files from the last office holiday party we'd attended together as a family the previous December. I braced myself as the first clip began to play, stomach roiling in dread. There we were, all smiles as we posed with Beckett's arm around my waist, while obnoxious Christmas tunes blared in the background. But as the camera panned out, there was Fiona across the room in a skimpy Santa dress, making absolutely no effort to conceal the lust in her eyes as she openly ogled Beckett. The seething knot in my gut tightened sickeningly as the video rolled on, Fiona's deplorable behavior growing more outrageous and unambiguous with each passing moment. She was practically molesting him with her eyes in front of me and everyone. And Beckett? That faithless worm was lapping up every seductive overture. I watched in mounting fury as they finally broke off from their respective partners to disappear together behind a set of closed doors, oblivious to anything but their ravenous need to consummate whatever twisted office tryst they'd indulged in who knows how many times. The screen froze on the image of their two forms disappearing into the shadowy hallway, finally prompting an anguished cry of rage and pain to tear violently from my throat. How dare he! How dare that wretched man make such an utter mockery of me, of our vows, our family! I became faintly aware of Jude pulling me close, mumbling soothing words that should have made no sense, but somehow did through the thick crimson haze of fury shrouding my vision. That worthless piece of shit, I snarled, shaking violently. He doesn't deserve anything but to burn. I know, sis, Jude grated out, rubbing my back. We're going to make him pay, I promise. He can't hurt you or the girls anymore. In that moment, something imperceptibly shifted inside me. Like a circuit breaker overloading, all my hurt, humiliation, and outrage refocused itself into a singular diamond-edged point of unwavering resolve. Beckett, his whore, his vile deceptions— all of it was simply delaying the inevitable. The universe itself seemed to be conspiring to repay him in kind for every tear he'd wrung from the innocence in his life, with interest. I detached myself from Jude's comforting grip, my hands no longer trembling. In fact, I'd never felt more calm, more clear about what needed to happen next. Drawing a deep breath, I smiled thinly. Karma has him now. It's only a matter of time before everything he values crumbles to dust. Jude searched my expression carefully before giving a curt nod. No mercy? None, I replied flatly. He sealed his own fate the moment he chose to shred his family for selfish pleasure. Now it's time to reap what he's sown. With those final words, I turned and swept from the room, my path forward as unshakable as the coming retribution awaiting Beckett. The battle was all but won. I had merely been the first volley. Karma never misses her mark and her price would be everything that smug, sniveling coward held dear. The day of the final divorce hearing dawned bright and crisp, as if the universe itself was smiling on the grand unraveling about to unfold. I woke feeling buoyant, filled with equal parts determination and righteous satisfaction. Today marked a new beginning, an emancipation from the shackles of Beckett's betrayal. You ready for this, sis? Jude's gruff voice made me turn to see him leaning against the kitchen counter, arms crossed resolutely. A wolfish grin spread across my face. More than ready, it's time that snake got his just desserts. He returned the predatory smile with a curt nod. Then let's go bury the bastard. Striding into the courthouse flanked by Jude on one side and Miranda on the other, I couldn't help but feel a swell of fearless power. An army marching to war— about to decimate the duplicitous enemy in our sights. Beckett was already there, all blustery arrogance as he huddled with his expensive legal team. His gaze flickered over to us, eyes narrowing with contempt when they landed on me. I simply lifted my chin higher, unmoved by his feeble attempt at intimidation. The cur was about to learn the true consequences of his actions. All rise for the Honorable Judge Marlowe, the bailiff barked as the court was promptly called into session. What followed was a brutal dismantling of every lie, I, every ploy Beckett and his mercenary legal squadron had undoubtedly cooked up to mitigate the fallout of his moral squalor. Miranda, as ever, was a ruthless tour de force as she laid bare every compromising secret, every devastating revelation that plunged the dagger into Beckett's shriveled heart from a thousand different angles. 
the falsified financial records concealing money paid to Fiona, the sordid videos of inappropriate behavior at company functions, the compounded lies and blatant dereliction of duty as a husband and parent, all of it twisted the knife a little deeper with each expert revelation. Unable to withstand the psychological flaying any longer, I watched with a strange detachment as Beckett finally cracked under the avalanche of evidence against him. Enough, he roared, crimson-faced and spittle-flying. I get it. I made mistakes. But you'll strip me of everything just to settle your demented thirst for vengeance? The outburst was swiftly silenced by a stern rap of the judge's gavel. Judge Marlowe, a wizened, no-nonsense woman, regarded Beckett with thinly-veiled contempt. Mr. Foster, your mistakes appear to encompass a breathtaking compendium of deceit, adultery, and deficient moral character, wholly inappropriate for an involved father and husband. Her words lanced through the hushed courtroom, eliciting smug murmurs of agreement. Beckett seemed to shrink in on himself under her flinty gaze. I have reviewed the abundant documentation of misconduct from both parties. She fixed me with an inscrutable look before continuing, leaving me on tenterhooks. And in light of the overwhelming proof of malfeasance, infidelity, and gross negligence by Mr. Foster, I am granting Mrs. Alara Foster's claims in their totality. A stunned silence fell over the court as the ramification of the judge's decree sank in. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Miranda not even trying to suppress a self-satisfied grin. Beckett looked as though he'd been struck by lightning. "'Your Honor, surely there's a basis for appeal or compromise. This is madness. You can't take everything from me like this.' Judge Marlowe's expression didn't falter. "'I can and I am, Mr. Foster. Total financial support and custody of the children are hereby awarded to Mrs. Foster.' Her gaze swiveled to pin me squarely. I trust you'll endeavor to provide a stable, nurturing environment freed from further trauma or toxicity. My breath caught at her shrewd scrutiny, but I quickly regained my composure, time to show the composure this battle had forged in me. You have my word, Your Honor, I stated calmly, openly meeting her imploring look. My daughter's well-being is my highest priority, even above my own. The judge gave a somber nod of acknowledgment before returning her attention to the slack-jawed Beckett, ill-prepared for the cosmic reversal of fortune. "'Court is adjourned,' she announced with a decisive slam of the gavel. The world seemed to judder back into motion as the gallery erupted in a din of reactions, good and ill. But I barely registered any of it over the thunderous rush of adrenaline and vindication crashing over me in waves. I was free. Finally— blissfully untethered from that festering anchor of deceit and misery. Even sweeter, the man who had engineered my suffering was being served the ultimate comeuppance, stripped of everything that mattered to fuel his bottomless ego. Beside me, Jude simply clapped a hand on my shoulder, squeezing proudly as our eyes met. You did it, sis. That son of a bitch got exactly what was coming to him. My smile was radiant as I watched Beckett slump in utter defeat, the weight of his well-deserved reckoning finally crushing him. A new chapter was being written from the ashes of searing betrayal, one of redemption and unbreakable perseverance through any storm, and I would walk its path unbowed, the battle-forged protector of the only treasures that truly mattered, the family he failed.